Hello everyone. Welcome to another Wave to Wave webinar series on automated fiber switching technology and applications. We invite you to view our complete series of webinars to get the full overview of beneficial impacts of automated fiber switching in various deployment applications. Today we will look at introducing automated fiber switching as an enabling ecosystem component for passive optical networks or PONs. Today's webinar will showcase the benefits of automated fiber switching technology in PONs with a focus on protection schemes. Next slide, please. We'll start with the discussion on typical PON deployment architectures. Here we will focus on both tradition and emerging approaches within newer standards and product architectures. This is followed by a detailed investigation into protection schemes. Although protection schemes are called out in the standards, most vendors have settled on a couple approaches within their product sets. We will then look at the CapEx and OpEx challenges associated with these protection schemes. Specifically, we'll investigate the financial impacts of providing protection with basic PON products with no ecosystem support from other beneficial products. Once we have reviewed these challenges, we will discuss the benefits of integrating automated fiber switch technology into PON infrastructures and the immediate positive impact it has on both CapEx and OpEx expenditures. After the benefits discussion, we will turn our attention to a brief overview of an AFS technology fabric that is cost effective, efficient, and elegant in its implementation approach. We'll conclude with a quick look at the long-term benefits of utilizing AFS technology within the PON ecosystem. So let's get started. Next slide, please. When speaking of PON technologies, we generally refer to the following equipment. An optical network terminal or a unit referred to as ONT or ONU that is located directly at the customer premises to provide a communications connection to customer equipment. Next is an optical distribution network or ODN that typically consists of optical cables and one by N passive optical splitters. And finally, an optical line terminal or OLT located in a central office or CO and controls the bidirectional flow of information across the ODN. You may notice the terms ONU and ONT are used interchangeably. However, standards such as ITUT recommendation G.987 define an ONT as an ONU that supports a single subscriber. Therefore, ONU is a more general term. Also, the term OLT is used here to refer to the network side equipment that is connected to multiple ODNs. Therefore, an OLT network element typically contains multiple OLT line cards. The splitter is a bidirectional device that in the upstream direction or towards the CO couples the signals received from multiple ONUs onto a single fiber. In practice, the splitters used in PONS generally have symmetric loss and optical power split characteristics. Next slide, please. There's a lot of variation in where PON ONUs have been deployed relative to end users. Three of the ONU location options are an ONU deployed at a single family residence called fiber to the home, at an apartment building or small business referred to as fiber to the building, and in a curbside pedestal serving several single family residences called fiber to the curb. The ONUs may be located either inside or outside of homes and buildings, and in the fiber to the curb case, the ONU is likely connected to each residence using a dedicated copper-based service. Locating the splitter and split ratios are important factors in the economics of pond deployments. For a high density area, the splitter needs to be placed close to customers for it to be cost effective because the shared fiber represents a large percentage of the loop length. For medium to low density areas, the splitter will likely be more cost effective in the central office to reduce the OPEX needed for truck rows. These architectures are also interchangeable from a planning perspective with other types of access fiber network deployments, such as wireless cell sites. Next slide, please. Centralized radio access networks, referred to as CRAN, is a proposed architecture for emerging next generation cellular networks. CRAN deployments are important since LTEA is already here and 5G is on the horizon. To maximize asset utilization and simplify cellular infrastructures, wireless network operators are exploiting the convergence of wireline and wireless networks. 
since a radio tower site can consist of at least three sectors with each supporting at least one carrier, the number of fiber connections for one tower site can be as high as 12. As a result, it is necessary to find an optical transport solution to support streams between CO digital unit equipment and remote radio units while consuming as few fiber resources as possible. Ponds can be used to connect CO-based digital units to remote radio units, and this network is often referred to as front hall. As the number of streams on a single pair increases, it becomes more important to have geographical redundancy and protection in case of a fiber cut. A high number of RU streams can be transported into a reduced number of optical fibers using wavelengths and ponds instead of dedicated fiber links. Given the increase in traffic bandwidth, it is also important pond standards and technologies support bandwidth evolution. Next slide, please. Most deployed ponds in the U.S. are gigabit or GPON systems, while Ethernet or EPON systems were more popular internationally. To support higher bandwidth demands by applications and subscribers, telcos are deploying next generation PON or NGPON systems involving 10 gigabit GPONs, 10 gigabit EPONs, and WDM PONs, which all support much higher bandwidth than legacy PON technology. However, all PON systems have an OLT. The only difference is that GPONs and EPONs use a passive optical splitter. The WDM PON use an arrayed waveguide grading filter or AWG filter to separate the wavelength communications channels between the OLT and ONT. Next slide, please. Turning our attention to economic considerations, the outside plant fiber cable installation costs are the largest component of the total cost. However, the bulk of equipment costs are tied to the very expensive OLT units. The University of Colorado Boulder performed a detailed actual outside plant study with a 20% subscriber penetration rate. In their model, the OLTs supported eight access modules or line cards. Each access module had four 10 gig ports. Each OLT also contained a system controller module and a switching module for management functions and aggregation of traffic. The OLT cost for end subscribers is represented as shown in the equation on the slide. Their analysis demonstrated the total cost for OLT equipment for 2,048 subscribers is 1.14 million, and the total equipment deployment amounted to 2.28 million. Therefore, it makes a lot of sense to minimize OLT costs as much as possible since it represents 50% of total equipment deployment costs. Not shown here, but was also part of the study was OLT power consumption, which is typically around 18 watts per hour. This yields 157 kilowatts per year. Assuming an electricity price rate of 12 cents per kilowatt hour, the power cost per year per OLT amounted to $165,000 per year. So it's a no brainer to minimize shelves and access module line cards of OLTs as much as possible. Obviously, adding equipment for pond service protection is also a very important consideration. Next slide, please. As shown on the slide, the G.983.1 standard for pond protection schemes are referred to as types A, B, C, and D. In type A, only the feeder fiber is redundant. Type B protection duplicates the line card of the OLT so that the ODN and optical interfaces at the OLT are protected. Type C represents one for one dedicated path protection with full duplication of all pond equipment and facilities. Type D protection specifies independent duplication of the feeder and the distribution fibers and allow telcos to offer differentiated reliability levels for users. Obviously, the ITUT standard types C and D with full protection offer high reliability, but unfortunately, costs are way too high to be practical except in specialized applications. These levels of protection are typically reserved and engineered for special services, such as high tariff business services over dedicated fiber plant. Next slide, please. Shown here is the type B protection method, which is the majority of current pond protection schemes and OLT equipment redundancy capability. Both the OLT line cards and the F1 facilities are protected. Although the OLT line cards is one for one redundant, only one of the line cards can transmit to the ONT. 
The redundant OLT line card and the F1 facilities protect all the ONUs, residential and business. The business ONTs may have the F2 and ONU port protection as well. The single family residential ONT is on a non-redundant F2 path, which represents most deployments. Before protection switching, the OLT needs to perform ranging to the ONUs. After completing the ranging process, the OLT switches the port 2 link. This implementation option requires duplicated line card ports for every in-service port and therefore increase OPEX expenses of provisioning and protection. Next slide, please. On the left, we show the vast majority of OLT equipment protection implementation, which provides an in-service line card slot and a protect line card slot. Another approach is on the right, whereby the entire bottom shelf is protecting the upper shelf. Why? Well, on occasion, telco CO equipment engineers find it better from an operations perspective to designate an entire shelf as a protection shelf versus labeling a card slot as quote unquote protecting and hoping for the best. Both OLT protection implementation options actually waste close to 50% of the in-service deployed OLT equipment, increasing CapEx and OpEx expenses. Since economical trade-offs are critical in large-scale telco networks, improving reliability by duplication of OLTs, shelves, and line cards is considered extremely expensive. However, with telcos under pressure to minimize fiber-to-the-home capital expenditures, it is not realistic to provide one-for-one -one redundancy for each OLT line card. Therefore, telcos often forego protection in residential, mixed residential and fault tolerant data services applications and just hope for the best. That's a lot of hope given that some of the denser OLT equipment can provide as many as 256 line card slots terminating 128 ONUs per line card or 32,000 uh, plus total service lines. Utilizing new Automated fiber switch products can alleviate these redundant OLT equipment expenses and make protection more affordable. Next slide, please. The only pond ecosystem component that can alleviate this duplication expense is an automated fiber switch as shown here. The AFS provides termination for the service facilities X and Z. If there is an OLT line card equipment failure, the AFS can switch to a designated OLT line card. After the switch is made, the OLT line card goes through its normal process of turning up the pond. That way, any line card can serve as standby protect for the entire shelf at the discretion of the equipment engineer. In another scenario, protection can be via a protection fiber facility. The AFS provides the switching for the protect OLT line card connection to any designated protection fiber facility cable. An AFX protection switch command can be the serial automated port failure message that is generally sent to telco CO alarm monitoring systems and simultaneously sent to the AFS management interface. In addition, a protection switch command can be sent to an AFS centralized element management system located in the central office or monitoring operations center. Note only a single OLT line card need be designated as the protect line card. This allows a protect line card to protect any number of in-service line cards with the AFS providing the fiber cross connect function. So an AFS enabled PON can provide one per end redundancy with a single spare OLT line card serving as a backup for all of the serving PONs. When a line card is lost, the affected pawn is remotely connected to the spare card. Service can be restored quickly and cost effectively without requiring a high urgency truck roll. A technician can replace the problematic line card on a regular maintenance schedule. This requires a fairly advanced AFS implementation technology. Next slide, please. An automated fiber switch offers dynamic fiber cross-connect capability at layer one. As you can see, the devices support in-input ports and in-output ports with a cross-connect matrix that defines the connectivity between input and output ports. This type of switch, such as offered by wave to wave with its ROAM line of products, provides significant flexibility, CapEx, and OpEx savings. 
The operation and maintenance software controls the equipment, issues cross-connect commands, and manages the equipment. The switch accepts a fiber interface at one of its ports and connects it to another port based on software-enabled connection commands. There are two kinds of fiber switch technologies, namely OEO or optical electrical optical and OOO or optical 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 such as with the Rome product. An OEO switch requires the light signal to be converted to an electrical signal to be processed and switched before being converted back to a light signal. On the other hand, OOO technology is done purely through photonics without conversion overhead and latencies. Since AFS is deployed in place of manual fiber connectivity products, it is imperative that connectivity not be dependent on power or any active components. In addition, the AFS should be transparent to bit rate and protocols. AFS systems that meet these requirements allow telcos to minimize labor requirements, eliminate database mismatches resulting from human error, optimize CapEx, and facilitate testing and maintenance. Given its capabilities and intelligent mapping capabilities, there are a number of long-term benefits when AFS is properly utilized as a PON ecosystem component. Next slide, please. Staying competitive and ensuring long-term profitability are two crucial drivers for today's telco. To ensure their profitability, telcos must optimize their networks and carefully control both capital and operational expenses. Positioning the AFS at critical flexibility points allows just that, while also improving quality of service by offering a number of critical capabilities, including remote troubleshooting of problem fibers, central monitoring of service degradation over time, rapid fiber identification, cost-effective protection, and accurate connectivity records. Additional benefits of automated fiber switching as an integral PON ecosystem component include faster time to revenue via reduced provisioning times, increased customer satisfaction since service turnup delays are minimized, fewer truck rolls leading to direct labor savings, sharing of centrally located test equipment such as OTDRs, and as noted earlier, efficient use of central office space and power utilization. AFS also significantly reduce other equipment capital expense needs while reducing operating expenses, delivering a return on investment in less than two years. Next slide, please. We have demonstrated that automated fiber connectivity enables a more efficient optical protection network architecture. It reduces the amount of protection circuits while it increases the availability of service. The result is significant CapEx savings and improved SLA success rates. Today, an average of nine connection points per customer are found inside a large central office that serves more than 50,000 subscribers. This large connection point number is due to poor migration planning and poor documentation of existing fiber links. An AFS will allow automated identification of fiber cables and cross connects reducing the number of redundant fiber connection points. A great example of an AFS is Wave to Wave's Roam system, which enables fiber connections to be made automatically, remotely, quickly, and without on-site manual intervention. The Roam product is about network connections, when needed and where needed. With patented mechanical latching technology and fiber management, Making connections is possible remotely, precisely, and robotically. With Rome, service providers can minimize network outages and restore service more quickly when they occur. In addition, Rome reduces CapEx via equipment reductions and OpEx via reduction in truck rolls and technician labor by automating fiber management. The Rome product allows telcos to remotely configure connections without risky manual patching and without exposing high usage connections to human error. So in summary, the only effective way to manage pond costs is to minimize equipment and labor requirements. Specifically, it is imperative to minimize the need for duplicate OLT equipment. Therefore, automated fiber switches such as the Rome product line should be a key ecosystem component in the telco arsenal to address pond economics and ongoing operations concerns. 
That brings us to the end of the webinar. And thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you on another webinar in the series. And please feel free to send any questions you may have to info at wave2wave.com. Have a great day and see you soon.